so I'm Amy Corte. I'm an architect and I'm the um, president of Aerostreet. I'm also one of six partners at Aerostreet. Um, and I'm here with um, Kachina Studer, who is a product developer and our UX strategist, who has also been developing a number of Unity applications and experiences for us, as well as um, Kat Schneider. Schneider. <laughs> I know, I know your name. <laughs> He's one of our architectural designers and has really been um, at the forefront of testing out the AR and VR experiences for us with our clients, um, with our projects, and with the design of buildings. Um, so there's us. Um, we have a couple slides. We're setting this up as a fireside chat. Um, and really, if you don't know Aerostreet, we're a Boston-based architecture firm that also specializes in environmental graphics, interiors, urban design. Um, we're about 100 people. Um, and we do everything from um, infrastructure at airports to mixed-use developments that include residential, hospitality, hotels, retail, um, to specialty retail experiences for Brooklyn Boulders, um, like climbing gyms, um, to charter schools, K through 12 education. So our clients, our buildings, our spaces are extremely diverse in scale, as well as who we have to connect with as clients. And so today we're gonna talk about, I'm trying to advance the slide. Um, there we go. Um, really kind of where we started with our practice with AR and VR um, about five years ago to where we are now and to what we really see um, uh, AR and VR, XR, right, and how that will apply to the future. And so part of our practice is really looking at these technologies, how um, everything from augmented reality and virtual reality influence how we design our buildings to how we might interact and engage with this virtual layer over our physical space. Um, so as well as how we might explain complex problems to our clients. And it's really part of a broader research and innovation lab that we have at the firm. And so XR, AR, VR is part of one segment of that, as well as data analytics, how we measure um, how people move through our spaces, how we can use predictive modeling to understand how our buildings are designed and how they might be used by occupants, as well as things like autonomous vehicles, right? If you think about um, AV um, impacting how we move through our cities and our projects having a lifespan of about five years. Um, we need to be planning for that in the buildings we're designing now. And so why don't we start by talking about um, you know, wh what we're doing in AR, VR, how we started it and um, what we saw as the, um, you know, how does it really change your creative process? Um, we'll start with Katrina. Yeah, um, so when we got started with all of this, it was kind of just like a summer internship, like experience, sort of like that long um, of a project timeline. Um, and it's interesting because as a previous like designer, well, I'm still a designer, as a designer and um, uh, coming from an art, art major background, um, Right, we had tangible interfaces to actually create design. Like it was, I don't know how many designers are in the room here, but uh, Photoshop is a really great example. You are thinking something, you're able to create something very directly, and that's your product, that's your output. Um, and with architecture uh, coming to the firm, it was it was a really interesting, slightly different process. There was a lot of uh, memory involved. There was a lot of um, kind of uh, interpretation of how design will be or from the two-dimensional aspect, how the design is actually supposed to look three-dimensionally. And um, that's, that's so interesting because that's kind of been the process um, for hundreds of years, like creating two-dimensional drawings to then give to um, somebody who's gonna construct this building. Uh, and there's a lot that's lost in that process. There's a lot of like design intent that's lost in that process. Um, so really this was kind of an initiative started to figure out, well, where, where do we start switching that over? Where do we start creating a new kind of process for architects to be able to get to that third step without having that second step in the middle? Having a direct um, interface design tool that can help you create and iterate quickly and so that other people can understand that process as well. So coordination is gonna be a lot faster. Um, talks with clients and even understanding, again, getting them on the same page with you and having to explain a little less uh, is incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's a really great part of the process. And you know, initially, um, we started this initiative, what, like three, about three or four, three, three years ago now. Um, so there weren't really tutorials out there. VR was, was kind of just coming into its own as a, as a product um, for consumers. Um, 
to start developing with. It wasn't even a product for consumers at that point. So uh, a lot of the interactions were coming from like sh first person shooter designs. Like it, it really wasn't anything that was made for, uh, there was no tutorial. There was no tutorial for how do you create these immersive environments for architects or even for design. Um, so having to kind of reinterpret that and change that was definitely a process. Um, and there was a lot of gamification of ideas, just talking to architects and getting a, a more of that gamif gamification while still having a serious output in the end. Yeah, I mean, I think what's showing on the screen is really one of our first experiences that you built um, based on that gamification. I mean, do you wanna talk about how we evaluate what's successful, what's not successful, how we bring that to our design process and how we've you know, used it in that. Yeah, yeah, so um, it's interesting because obviously like it felt like initially like this blank page that we were all starting with. Um, what's VR gonna look like for architecture? But really it was a lot of unboxing and unpacking. It was like having this full garage of ideas and, and concepts from previous generations of architects and trying to find ways to keep some of those components, hold on to them and really build something new out of them, reorganize them, restructure them, repurpose them. And um, it became an entire discussion on how we were gonna take some of those components and repackage them for architects. Um, so the evaluation process is kind of like, it's, it's always evolving because essentially we're, we're taking one idea, trying to implement it, and then we're evaluating it and we're saying, okay, so where does this fall in our hierarchy of needs? Has the, this um, proven anything to us? And I think that this is actually a really good example because real-time rendering is phenomenal. Like, I, I, don't think, I don't think people really understand. Like, this is not something that, that is, is packaged and then like given to you. Like, I can do this in Unity without creating a build. This is real-time rendering and it's phenomenal. And for an architect, that's really phenomenal because we're working in two dimensions. We're working in CAD programs. Um, which you can pull renderings from, but that's gonna take hours. And to get really good quality renderings, that's gonna take maybe a day or two unless you're using a farm. Um, so just switching over to that process and trying to figure out what it is we wanna keep, mm -hmm. that's a really good um, process of evaluating. <laughs> but I wouldn't say that there's any anything to compare it to right now. I think we're gonna need to yeah. see moving forward. And our files are huge. And so our files are real-time yeah. rendering is critical. Um, okay, advance to the next one. So why don't we talk about community engagement a little bit. I think a big part of our process is really engaging the community or engaging our clients, um, cities, municipalities, real estate developers, investors, and bankers who really have no, um, not a lot of experience in reading plans. Um, we need to be able to communicate um, both our vision for the building very quickly and get them into either the headset or an augmented experience. And so, some successful examples that we've had in the last year um, have really been the King Open School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is one of the first net zero schools in Massachusetts. And so for that school, um, which is illustrated in the upper um, right example, is we really put, um, we put the students, elementary students, in the VR goggles, as well as the teachers and the educators. And the goal of that was to um, teach them about the sustainable features of the building in order to drive the building performance um, to be more minimal in terms of its energy use, as well as help them understand um, kind of the occupant use and how they could use the building um, once it was constructed in order to make that building more sustainable. Another build we did was looking at climate change and how you visualize that. And so taking things from um, projected sea level rise, which is, um, you know, you can explain with a three-dimensional Photoshop image of water over a map, but it's not the same when you put somebody in the immersive experience of VR or AR, and they actually understand the level of water and how that will impact their home or their business. And so for us, you know, taking that immersive experience and really using it to tell that story and to engage the community has been critical. And so Kat, you know, I'd love to, if you could talk about maybe what were some early challenges of the technology? How did we um, make stakeholders feel comfortable? Mm -hmm. and, and talk a little bit about what we did. Yeah, I think no one wants to admit that they you know, haven't done things perfectly, but I think the <laughs> VR has presented us with the opportunity to really think critically about how we share the story of design. Uh, and one of the things we learned early on, we would take the VR headset into a meeting and you know, we're enthralled with the technology, we're excited about it, so we expect people to put it on and have this like profound moment of discovery that like, yes, this architecture is beautiful and everything's perfect, sign it, stamp it, we're ready to go. Um, and I think something we learned early on is that that's 
first 15 seconds when you hand somebody a VR headset is almost the most critical aspect of an experience. It's how you transition somebody from their world and their context into a constructed reality that's curated to arrive at a design decision. Uh, so I think one of the biggest lessons learned was picking apart that 15 seconds, 30 seconds. And what we started to do um, is drive the experience first and create that curiosity through taking the element of, oh, this is a new technology, you're not well versed in it, to I'm gonna drive, and when you feel interested enough to take it over, here it is, and now you have a language to discuss this VR experience with us. Yeah, it's really kind of <clears throat> redefining what a meeting is with our yeah. clients and how we might bring the technology into those meetings. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about equity um, yes. and diversity <laughs> inclusion? Because that's a key part of how we design our spaces. Yeah, I think there, there are some great talks at this conference, particularly focused around equity in VR and AR, but what's been nice about using the technology in our professional practice is we've been able to unpack equity in how we articulate design to people. Um, as part of the architectural process in Boston, uh, you have to go before different community groups. And uh, normally you're bringing documents, set of plans, sections, things that are very well read by other architects. Um, and what we've been noticing is that VR has been a really great equalizer, AR as well, um, in establishing equity in the way people can advocate for what they want in design. Uh, particularly, we're feeling, I think, the impacts of there's lots of development happening in Boston. People have strong feelings about uh, the infrastructure that's going in. How can we create equity in allowing our end users to advocate for what they want and what is going to actually benefit their community? And also giving them an experience that they can take home, that they can experience mm -hmm. on their own time, kind of in their own space, and really understand the project from their point of view, too. Mm -hmm. Are there other successful examples you want to talk about? Or? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of pictures. The pictures with the kids are fun, because every time we give a VR headset to a child, they're much more reckless than an adult. <laughs> so it's great user testing. Anyone's looking for yeah. pointers on user testing, 100%. give your stuff to kids. They will not hold back on feedback. Um, but the King Open School is a great example. We have the task of explaining really complicated systems that help them have a healthier environment, low VOC materials, photovoltaics, using gray water systems. Um, and that's not rhetoric, that's not vocabulary that like your typical third grader is gonna understand. So by being able to mock that up and connect them with VR experiences of this is where that feature is happening and this is how you're actually gonna interact with it on a daily basis, that was a really great use case in explaining how sustainability is going to affect the daily life of a fourth grader in school. Um, something that also has been really fun is we just started using it, uh, or we used it with a restaurant client. Um, really fun design conundrum, very small space, and they had a really grand, beautiful vision for how they wanted to create like a gastro pub that was really lively, but with very limited space. Um, and something that was successful about that is we, uh, they put on the VR headset, they're in our office, and they were like, pass me your water bottle, like I really wanna see how the bar feels. So they teleport back to the bar, and they're in it, and they feel that it's successful, and to be able to give people the opportunity to react viscerally to the design, rather than this color feels, or this color looks okay, to this space feels great, and this is exactly what we're going for. Um, has been a really great. It's been a game changer. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the other game changer is really around storytelling. And there's been a lot at AWE this year about um, you know, how do we tell stories? How do we use augmented reality to tell stories? How do we use that immersive experience to tell stories? And a big part of what our job as architects is to facilitate decisions around really complex spaces, complex design projects, um, and how we not only have a tool now of visualization, but also um, an interaction tool. And to be able to create that and to allow our clients to engage in that, I'm just curious, kind of both of you, you know, how do you, how do you see these XR experiences um, evolving you know, with architecture and urban design? Yeah, so um, interesting, the Bar Mercado client, um, so, we, I didn't really expect um, like the clients to be mm -hmm. using like the kind of very interactive experiences. I kind of thought like, hey, we're gonna develop this internally. We're gonna like get to figure out how we're gonna use this moving mm -hmm. forward. But we started using it with, with clients fairly quickly and they, they really picked up on it. They really felt like they were a little bit more of um, part of the conversation. And with the, with the bar client um, specifically, uh, they saw this as an opportunity to um, possibly train some of the um, staff that was working in the environment because it was such a niche like uh, 
um, small, smaller like restaurant concept, restaurant layout. Um, the kitchen was a lot smaller than your average restaurant kitchen. Um, so just getting, getting a really good chef on board to understand the domain of their space, um, that really helped. And, and being able to tell that story of um, the, the client's vision and the client's goals and, and how we've laid out and designed the space, um, all of that, being able to tell that story not only to the client and seeing how they react, but being able to then have the client um, have that as an opportunity to tell their own story has, has been really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the example that you guys are looking at on the screen is an AR kit hack um, that was meant to, so this project is in the seaport in Boston and it's spatially complex in that there are two stakeholders, a hotel and a residential property that share a garage and a ground plane. Um, and articulating the way that the spaces kind of weave together was not the easiest in two dimensions. Um, so we had started playing around with this as a concept for how do we explain and get people excited about something three-dimensional. And the things that have come out of it or the conversations we've been able to have um, have been really great from the client side where you show them something like this. And then even our architects in-house are talking about how can we use AR to make construction details more understandable. If there's something that's really not resonating in two-dimensional format, how do we extract that detail from the page, blow it up, make the components really easily understood by our contractors or the people who are actually boots on the ground to put this thing together. Um, and it, again, it serves as a really great equalizer, but I think what we're learning is present the technology, it may not be perfect, but our end users have amazing ideas for how we can sort of meet them where they, with what they need for VR and AR. Yeah, and I would add on to that. Um, you know, as our clients have gotten used to AR and VR, we've been able to propose a lot more radical ideas. And so, in the same project, um, you know, you've gotten them used to AR, VR. You think about when the building will actually, you know, act open and be built. Um, and so, this project, which is under construction now, you know, we started it in 2014. It'll open in 2021, and there's 300 residential units. And if you think about the typology of a multifamily apartment building with a double loaded corridor and what we can do as designers and architects, you know, in terms of what is this, what are those surfaces of the corridor feeling, but then also expand that further. And so part of our pitch to them of the design of that internal corridor was not just, you know, here's what your carpet, your walls and your ceiling could be, but you know, here's a augmented corridor experience that you could imagine projecting within the interior of your building. And so I think one measure of our success is that we didn't get laughed out of the room, right? We're presenting this Which to bankers, to financial people, to developers, <laughs> and it was just part of our design proposal to them. And so I think once we begin to expand kind of what we do from the physical to the virtual and physical, um, there's a lot of possibilities that could happen. Um, this is the bar that you guys have been yeah, talking this about. Is, this is a great yeah. example. So this is actually, um, the, the format of this is not like as well rendered as um, some of our other formats because uh, this is actually being put into web Don't GL. apologize for it. <laughs> I, okay, I'm sorry for saying sorry. Um, so this is, this is actually go, gonna be put into WebGL, which is um, kind of hard to do with high render quality because you don't really know what kind of computer somebody's using on their end. Um, but it's a really great way uh, that we're moving forward with some of our projects um, to be able to give uh, either clients or people just interested in our practice or peop uh, people in the community um, the ability to interact with the space before it's even constructed. Um, and it's, it's gonna be beyond just like these kind of 3D walkthroughs. It's also gonna be part of our, our documentation process. It's also gonna be part of our, um, our delivery of our, of our architectural uh, sets. Um, so it's, it's a completely new way we're thinking about moving the architectural practice forward, getting it from this kind of, uh, we're modeling 3D, then we're making it 2D, then we're delivering it in 2D, but then it's gonna be 3D at the end. We're really, really, really trying to push for this kind of um, three-dimensional vision to three-dimensional mm -hmm. output. Um, so it's it's kind of a big challenge, um, and but technology moves a lot faster than our buildings do, so I have a feeling that we'll be able to iterate 
during the process and lifetime of the building while the design, building's while the building's being designed. And this built, ex yeah. experience is another example of how we're addressing the problems that come up because a lot of the feedback we got was, this is great, um, and I really like putting the VR headset on and having the Vive in your office because I don't have to deal with the base stations, but <laughs> what can I do when I'm home? What can I do when I'm in my office? What can I do when I have to sell this project to the other stakeholders that are gonna have to pay for it. Um, and so there's been a big effort, particularly done by Kachina, in doing this development in WebGL so that we can share that story. And VR, as an experience, lives on past the one hour meeting we have with our client. Oh, sweet, <laughs> don't have a lot of time with them. Yep. <laughs> And I think really, um, so our, our focus is twofold on AR and VR and XR. It's really, you know, what can we do now to help visualize the buildings that we're creating, help communicate that vision to the clients, to cities, um, to the communities, and then really, where do we see this going in five or 10 years, right? And so if we think about um, augmented reality and that it will be just another layer on our environment, how does that change what we design as buildings, our building facades, what types of information do they contain? Um, and so I think you know, if, if you guys you know, take the last you know, few minutes to talk about what's your vision kind of in terms of where we're taking this, the future, um, and how it relates to architecture, urban design. Yeah, so I mean, this, the question and answer is yeah. twofold because you're, you're talking about the consideration of the technology for these buildings that are being uh, designed uh, ten, 10 years out, essentially. So what technology are we gonna have in 10 years? Uh, probably very different than what we're seeing at this expo. Um, and so uh, it's an interesting concept because I think recently we've been bombarded by a lot. So there's a lot on the internet, there's a lot um, you know, advertising-wise, there are new ways of advertising. Um, and this is kind of that sort of hyperverse reality, um, kind of trying to show every possible example at the same time. But um, I think we are going to start to see um, what those domains are going to look like uh, in a more simplistic fashion. So trying to strike a really good balance between what your physical environment is and what your digital environment is, because there, right now there's just there's a divide. You're either plugged in or you're not plugged in, and that's kind of the way we think about it. And we're tra we're trying to push for this integration, this seamlessness, um, which means that we have to think about our physical environment. We can't fully override our environment. Um, and that's why it's augmented reality, it's not virtual reality. So the building design is incredibly important. Um, and I do think that architects play a role beyond just the physical design of the building because um, interaction is really important as part of the architecture and it always has been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the image that you're looking at, so the just before the craziness happens, the blue uh, sort of mesh facade, that's a rendering that we did before our VR AR practice began. Um, and something that we've been trying to do because there's sort of a duality in our research, we're very embedded in how do we get our clients excited and using VR and AR on an everyday basis, but we have to look ahead to a device agnostic future and we're not hardware people, we would never claim to be hardware people. Um, so what we're trying to figure out hardware. is how, how do we still perform and execute our responsibilities as an architect when we may not control how somebody perceives our building. Um, and is there an importance, we feel that there definitely is, on how surface plays a role in bounding, particularly augmented reality experiences. Uh, so this was an exercise just done in sketch form and then Photoshop and now in GIF form, but really depicting a future where a garage that we you know, designed couple of years ago um, can have longevity for 30 years because it can be reimagined and re-envisioned as an emergency shelter, a host for a, a conference, an office space, uh, depending on what a city might need at a particular moment in time. Uh, Amy mentioned we have a data scientist on board uh, and he's been very helpful in us pushing ourselves to think about how data and augmented reality combined can create really meaningful and impactful experiences in how people utilize space, particularly in an urban context. Yeah, and I would say that the, <laughs> the flexibility of the actual space is something that we're thinking about a lot because there is this, this turnover more frequently than there used to be. And um, so technology does play a huge role in the layout mm -hmm. of our buildings, and it's really important to think about both of those. Great, so I think we have a few minutes for some questions. Mm -hmm.